looked at the uh, wisdom, knowledge, and experience that resides in this room. Uh, this is pretty incredible. In case you guys didn't know, uh, we live in Northern California, which is a whole world away from you guys. So, uh, we're in a little tiny town called Auburn, which is just at the base of the foothills before you get to Tahoe's. You guys are driving by us to go skiing. And uh, we don't really have the opportunity to, uh, to interact with such an amazing group of uh, talented and experienced individuals uh, this often. So I appreciate the invitation. Jesse, I don't know where you're at. You're somewhere. There you are. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, I can give you a quick background about myself. Um, first of all, I am much older than I look. Uh, I'll be 57 next year. <laughs> you believe that? That's <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I work out every day. I work out every day. Yes, I have amazing hair. Thank you very much. That's different every day. It does whatever it wants to do. Um, but uh, I, uh, I grew up in Northern California. I grew up to uh, a family of missionaries, and I've had a very uh, diversified past. Um, my dad was in the Air Force originally. My parents met in New York. He was stationed out in McClellan Air Force Base in Northern California. And uh, after he served in Korea, um, he eventually became a missionary. And so I grew up as a missionary's kid, and I had the opportunity to travel to uh, a few different places. And then when I got a little bit older, um, I took some conventional jobs. I worked for UPS, worked at a record store, you know, all the stuff you got to do in high school. And uh, eventually I figured that I needed to settle down. So I took a really good, stable job as a police officer working for the California Highway Patrol. That was before the hair and the tattoos, for those of you who are judging me. I see it in your eyes. And uh, I was a police officer for 10 years. And uh, when people ever, when people ask me about that, I always tell them that I got to work through the Holocaust. Um, and what I mean by that is my first two weeks on the job, uh, the Rodney King riots broke out in L.A., which is where I was stationed. I worked in South Central L.A., Compton was my beat. So two weeks on the job, still uh, wet behind the ears. But we had our riots down in L.A., and shortly after that, we had the fires. And then we had the floods, and then we had the giant earthquake, and all this stuff happened within my first two years of being on the job. And uh, I was from Sacramento, and back, uh, I know it's not a city for those of you guys who are still judging me, um, but uh, back then it was definitely a cow town. And so uh, it was extreme culture shock going from Sacramento, where I pretty much spent most of my adult life, all of a sudden to LA and having all these things break out. Uh, but it taught me a lot of things. Eventually, when the city of L.A. calmed down, I found myself in an office in Glendale doing all the public relations. So I wrote magazine articles for the Washington Post, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, New York Times, you name it. Uh, every major publication across this country as far as newsprint. Every time we shot somebody, I told you why it was a really great thing that we did it and why you should support us and love us. And it was great. We keep them safe. And uh, I did public relations for a long time. Uh, eventually, they transferred me from Los Angeles back to Sacramento, and uh, when I got to Sacramento, uh, they also put me back in public relations, and they moved me into government relations. Since uh, Sacramento, everybody seems to want to make laws there, um, they figured that uh, we needed to be involved in that process, too, and I spent four years in that area serving as well. Um, after that, I had the honor and privilege of meeting this guy named Robert Kiyosaki. Has anybody heard of Robert, Robert Kiyosaki? Rich, 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 rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. So a friend of mine who was also a police officer said, you got to read this book. So I read this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He talked me into going to a conference. Uh, and uh, at the time, I had purchased a cigar store. I had taken up this hobby of smoking cigars. And uh, one day, the bright idea dawned on me that I was spending more money on cigars than I even realized. It wasn't that I was smoking a whole bunch, but I give them away. You know, Is anybody here a cigar smoker? Excellent. Wow. Sometimes. <laughs> Thank Sometimes. you, Seth. Thank you, Larry. I brought my own cigar smoker with me. And I saw that hand over there. Is it Gennady? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that wavering hand. It's okay. We can stand up for the peer pressure in here. Uh, but uh, anyways, I was an avid cigar smoker. And as cigar smokers are, you know, we're not really addicted. It's not a chain smoking thing. But you usually carry two or three cigars. You smoke one and you give the rest away. And I found out that I was spending a lot of money. And it wasn't because I was smoking a lot. I was giving a lot away. So... I met this guy, Robert Kiyosaki, and I read his book, and I thought, well, shoot, I'm doing this all wrong. I shouldn't be just smoking cigars. I better buy a cigar store. And so that's how I got into business. I bought a cigar store while I was still working as a highway patrol officer. And it wasn't because I wanted to work it. It was because it made better sense on paper 
from an accounting standpoint to own the store and smoke my own product than it did to keep on paying somebody else to do it. So I bought a cigar store and that entered my venture into business. And uh, I had the cigar store for seven years. I bought it in a little code up town, uh, which I guess if I was going to relate to you guys what that would be like, is I'd say maybe Hayward or something like that. Is that kind of code up? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But uh, in all honesty, it's a little tiny town uh, just before Auburn, and it's called Loomis. And I think the population there was a few hundred people, literally. And there was already an existing cigar store there, and the entire store uh, was probably about a fourth of this room. And when I took over the store, uh, overhead every day was $77 on a daily basis, and the average income of the store, gross income on a daily basis, was 66 bucks. And uh, so you can see we had a dying ship that allowed me to buy in cheap. And uh, one of the things that I did is the topic that we're going to be talking about tonight, and I don't sell cigars anymore, but this is a good premise for it, is that uh, I didn't know anything about the cigar business at all. I really honestly didn't even know very much about cigars either. I just knew that I liked to smoke cigars, it made a lot of sense to own the store as opposed to spend the, the amount of money that I was spending on cigars, and I needed a hobby. So I got a partner, and we opened, uh, we, the first thing that we did is we opened seven days a week, where the store was previously open six days a week, so we opened seven days a week. My partner worked six days a week, and I worked my full-time job as a highway patrol officer five or six days a week, and then on my day off, I would come in and I'd give my partner a day off. And as I started to look about the business, I, you know, I just went to what was typical. I started buying cigar magazines, and I started looking and seeing what everybody else was carrying. And we had a lot of competition. And so the first thing I realized is that the cigar store was a club. And a lot of these companies would only sell cigars to established businesses that had been around for a few decades. And this was back when the cigar boom was happening in the early 90s, so you know people were selling really horrible cigars for $20 a stick, and it was just a mess out there. So the folks who actually sold quality stuff, they didn't want to sell it to just anybody. And so I couldn't get a lot of stuff, so I had the cigar store, and then all of a sudden I couldn't get the stuff that people wanted. So I started looking around and said, well, shoot, I've got to do something different because this thing is not working. So I decided to get creative. Instead of taking all the normal business stuff and trying to compete on the same level that everybody else did, I decided to position myself differently, and I started to carry obscure product. I started looking for the rarest, most unusual product. And by rare, I don't necessarily mean good uh, at first. Um, by rare, I meant stuff that you would have a hard time finding out where the heck I got it from. And I literally started traveling all over the United States and then all over the country trying to find these rare gems that were actually good quality things, but that people couldn't price shop me on, or that I didn't have to worry about getting an account. So, I found friends in startups, from people who decided, wow, I can make cigars, and they would start making cigars, but they had nobody who was buying their product. So I'd go in and make them the best offer they could possibly have. You know, an average cigar store will buy one or two boxes of each model of each brand. And I'd go in and say, hey, you're making a quality cigar, how many boxes do you have? Well, I have, you know, 50 boxes, okay, I'll take them all. I want a really great deal, I'll take them all, and I want you to make me the exclusive distributor of your cigar uh, for the Sacramento area. And eventually, I had enough brands that I was able to make a really good go of it. And I was buying my stuff cheaper than the average popular stuff. I was selling them cheaper than the average popular stuff. And the next thing you know, I started building a loyal clientele. And on and on and on we went. So fast forward a whole bunch of years, um, I did the cigar store for seven years. Um, my shining moment, and in fact, the guys and I were just talking about it today as we were sitting outside smoking a cigar before we came down here, is that we had a day, and mind you, I, I told you how big the cigar store was. We had one day, it was a Saturday, where we sold $44,000 worth of cigars in an 11-hour period. Wow is right. That's a heck of a lot of cigars when the average price of the stick was seven bucks. So, I know there's a lot of engineers in the audience, you guys are doing the math right now. <laughs> so you can tell me how many sticks that was. But we sold a heck of a lot of cigars in 11 hours. We do 44,000 bucks in one day. Yeah. What was that? 6,367. Woo, I love it. Oh, Jeez, that's awesome. That's awesome, thank you, Carol. So, um, that's how I got into this. That's uh, more or less how I became an entrepreneur. I wasn't necessarily looking for it. 
But it started to make sense. And one of the things that uh, my parents had always said about me is that I was always creative. I was always looking for new ways to do things. And you know, as soon as I learned what the established norm was, I wanted to do something differently in order to produce a better product or a different product or take something somewhere where it wasn't going before. And eventually that brought me into something else. So we started a marketing company. And as I said, when I got into cigars, I knew nothing about cigars and I knew nothing about business. So I started a marketing company after I left the cigar business, and uh, we started doing things for clients. And we became known, we never advertised, uh, we never went out looking for clients, we never made cold cool calls or solicitation or anything like that. We started with one client, and he told another client, and that one told two, and exponentially we wound up with a really nice client list. And we were known for doing things differently. We started out with some startup companies, and the next thing you know, we got into some small businesses, and then eventually we started doing things for Audi and Volkswagen and a couple other notable companies. And one of the things that we were known for is doing things differently than everybody else had done. And it wasn't really that we were creative geniuses or anything like that. It was because of three simple things. We wanted to be creative, we wanted to be relevant, and we wanted to be excellent. And I think a lot of times you find a failed business because they maybe hang on to two things. Maybe they want to be creative and maybe they want to be relevant but they don't take the time to be excellent. Or maybe they are excellent, and maybe they're creative, but maybe they're not relevant and nobody wants the product that they have. And I honestly believe that those three things become a key to success in any business. Harold and I had a great conversation earlier today and we were talking about technological geniuses. And we were talking about sometimes people get so, so, so creative that they don't spend any time focusing on being relevant to the audience that they're talking to. And if you can't be relevant, then you're going to have a hard time getting even the best product in the world into the hands of somebody who's actually going to pay you for it. And if you can't get paid for it, then all of a sudden you don't have a business, you have a very expensive hobby. And we all know where that goes. And anyways, as we got into the cigar store thing and progressed into the marketing company, eventually we got tired of something that I'm sure many of you guys can. How many people here are entrepreneurs of some sort or another? So there's about 50% of you guys. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, how many of you want to be entrepreneurs? <laughs> okay, almost the entire rest of you. For the, how many of you didn't raise your hands at all so far? Uh, okay. They're not raising their hands. <laughs> <You're busy. laughs> we'll talk later. Um, but, you know, I believe that everybody gets to a point in life where you don't want any clients or a boss. Is that true? Can we all relate to that? We don't want any clients or a boss. We want to magically make money doing whatever we like. We don't want to interface with clients and all their problems and their needs and their phone calls and their emails and their, they don't understand this. And we also don't want a boss telling us what to do. We have this creative freedom and power in us that we just want to unleash and we want to see things happen. Well, as we were doing our marketing company, uh, we started getting really tired of clients. And unfortunately, they're the guys who pay our bills. Um, so we were stuck for a little while, but uh, we had a business mentor, and he was looking at all the things we were doing, because we were doing everything from web design to billboards, magazine ads, marketing campaigns, social media, you name it, anything to do with marketing, we were doing all of it. And it got to be very busy. We were a small company of seven people, and we were overworked, and even though we had a couple of years where we were making really great money, it really didn't pan out to the amount of work that we were putting in. So we came to a point where uh, our business mentor said, you guys need to focus on something that you like to do and stop doing all the other things that you're capable of doing, but you don't really like doing it at all. So we took a look at what we had and we saw that we really liked this, this area of video and film production. We've done a couple of television commercials and some other video projects for folks. And so we decided that we'd focus on that. So we closed down our company, which is called iCandy Marketing and Design, and we reopened under a different name. Same people, different name. It was called Live Media Entertainment. And the very first thing that we did, because we couldn't disassociate ourselves with marketing just instantly, is that we had a client, and they raced offshore power boats uh, across the country. And they were a mom and pop shop. Uh, they built custom race boats in Lake Tahoe, and uh, they also raced them personally. And they were an amazing couple. Uh, they were the Bonnie and Clyde of boat racing. And uh, we thought, actually, my partner Seth thought one day as we were coming back from doing some marketing consulting from me, he goes, these guys are making incredible dollars. We could just talk them into doing a reality television show. This would be crazy. So uh, we talked them into doing it. We raised some capital. 
and uh, we spent six months traveling back and forth across the country filming our very own reality television show for offshore powerboat racing. And uh, eventually that brought us into a whole different realm of folks. Uh, these folks were, I would say, the entry level in powerboat racing. Their boats were about $100,000, $125,000 or something like that. And eventually uh, we wound up getting to meet folks like Geico, uh, where their newest boat, Miss Geico, I think is something around a three or four million dollar venture before we put engines in it. And so um, we, we progressed from this small thing to this very large thing and we wound up filming companies like Geico racing these boats across the water 240, 260 miles an hour. And that progressed us into a whole different level. And we realized as we were doing reality television that this was a lot of work. I mean, cameras were on almost 24 hours a day. Crews were constantly getting rotated. We were traveling back and forth across the country for six months in a row. I mean, it was crazy. It was an overwhelming amount of work. So we took a step back for a second and said, there has to be something easier. So we decided, ah, it must be feature-length films. Feature-length films are great. You get an idea, it's easy. It's cake, right? Are you sure? You know, mind you, I don't know. I don't think we did any research. But we read a magazine once. No, we meant to. We bought, we bought a book. Uh, we bought a book, How to Make Movies for Dummies. True story. We never read it. Um, we read the cover in the back. We yeah. saw the cover in the back, picked it up at Barnes & Noble, never actually read it. That's a true story. Um, but we thought, man, feature-length movies, this is the way to go. So we're going to make a feature-length movie. So uh, again, we put our marketing brains on, and I'm not going to go too far into the details of that, but we came up with a pretty genius plan to uh, do a pretty genius movie. And uh, my partner, Seth, actually wrote the movie, and uh, it's based on a true story of, uh, of a life experience that he had, and it deals with loss. Uh, he lost his mom in a tragic car accident five years ago now. Yeah. Five years ago, and uh, he wrote a tremendous story of grief and healing about it. And uh, we uh, we had the opportunity to film that and turn it into a feature-length motion picture, which we just signed our first distribution deal on three weeks ago, and it's called No Parking. Um, so we're very excited about that. It'll be in the public in about another five six weeks, so you guys have the opportunity to see it. Um, but it opened us up to a whole new array of doing things differently. Um, it was a low. I was going to say low budget, but that's going to give you the wrong impression. So it's a very micro budget movie. Uh, we wrestled up another little group of investors. They paid for the movie, and uh, we wanted to do a couple things differently. And again, coming back to what I said before, we wanted to be creative, we wanted to be relevant, but we wanted to be excellent as well. And uh, for those of you guys who know anything about the movie industry, is I mean, pretty much, it's a it's a money losing industry. It's not a money making industry. If your name is Paramount, Universal, Sony Corporation, you make money because you make money in making the movie. If you're somebody who invests in movies, you pretty much lose money by and large. There's always that rare, uh, yeah, you have yeah, experience. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so there's that rare ballpark hit where someone hits a, a home run, but even then, the accounting system of making movies is very healthy. So one of the things that we set up to do is we wanted movies to make money again. We wanted investors to be protected. We wanted it to be a good business model. So uh, again, I remind you, we bought the book, How to Make Movies for Dummies. We never read it. Um, so we set a budget. And for any of you who know how you do a budget on anything, uh, we didn't. Uh, we just said that this movie was going to cost us $50,000, period. And then we thought we'd choose a real easy subject. Let's take a 3,000-mile road trip across California and Nevada uh, with two guys and film the whole thing on the road at all these different famous locations and uh, take our crew and everybody and we're gonna keep this at $50,000. Let's edit the movie and we'll keep it at 50, let's buy equipment, we'll keep it at $50,000. If anybody's doing any math here, you already know we're insane. <laughs> uh, but we set out to do it. Now I say, uh, how can we be creative? Uh, we literally did actually buy one magazine that we read. Uh, there was one magazine, and by happenstance, there was an article on a couple of guys uh, that were making a movie called Crank. And what they had done is they had gone to Best Buy, looked at some consumer and prosumer cameras, and figured that they could make a movie using this equipment. And they didn't do it because of the quality of the equipment, they did it because of the nature of the film. The film was a very action-packed film. These guys were filming on rollerblades and mopeds and stuff like that, so they needed lightweight cameras. And we thought, well, shoot, we're going to shoot a drama. They shot an action flick, guys jumping out of helicopters and stuff like that. Surely we can use the same equipment that they did and produce an excellent quality movie. So we did. We bought the same equipment that they did, and uh, we went to hire actors. 
And um, if you're doing any kind of math, let's just say we spent 10,000 bucks on camera gear, I think something like that. Um, so that leaves 40,000 for those of you guys who are more creative than analytical. And uh, that didn't leave us with a whole heck of a lot of money to do a 3,000 mile road trip, pay cast and crew. So we took the obvious route, we looked for volunteers. But you guys know that that obviously brings you some really good talent like Tom Cruise and stuff like that. They suck it up, but um, we couldn't take them. So uh, <laughs> we, we got some folks and uh, they'd never acted a day before in their life. Ever. Ever still. Um, <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Um, but they're phenomenal in this movie. Uh, because if you guys know anything about character actors, a lot of times if you get the right character actor, they can just be who they are. And that's what we did. We got two people who just got to be exactly who they were in real life. We changed their names and we gave them a little bit of a different story. But they didn't have to act. They just got to be themselves. Long story short, we filmed this movie. Uh, we have done uh, what, uh, when we were in AFM two years ago, showing the trailer of the movie, uh, every studio that we met with gave us a ballpark figure of thinking, yes sir? They may not know what AFM is. Oh, I'm sorry. AFM is the American film market where you go to sell independent movies in Hollywood. It happens once a year in November. And uh, thank you. Uh, we went down and we showed our trailer. Our whole movie wasn't ready yet, but we went down and showed our trailer. And every single studio that we met with, from Shoreline Entertainment and Lakeshore, all the way on across the board, estimated our movie production cost at three to ten million dollars. Every single one. We filmed and edited the entire movie for actually less than fifty thousand dollars because one investor still hasn't paid his full amount. That's pretty darn good. I know, huh? So I've still got room for somebody to come in at a thousand bucks. That's what we need to hear a fifty thousand dollar goal. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but my point in telling you all of that is not to pat ourselves on the back. My point in telling you all of that is we had a goal. Our goal was we wanted people who invested in the movie to actually make money. You know, our first deal that we signed will bring us in somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred and twenty five to one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars before we sign our next deal with Walmart. Walmart will bring us in another quarter of a million dollars. Now, that's not a whole heck of a lot of money, but on the other hand, it only costs us $50,000. Can you believe the math here? We're in the green. We're in the green. We're a successful independent movie company with no backing from any major studio or any major distribution company. We did this all on our own. Our movie will now play in five or six weeks in 23 countries and 8,000 venues. Wow. It's about being creative. It's about going outside the box. When I tell you we made a relevant movie, we made a movie about two guys in their late 50s driving around a 1973 Volkswagen bus. And you might say to yourself, well, what's relevant about that? Well, as I look at the medium age of everybody around the room, what are we at, 27, 28 years old, something like that? <laughs> How many people here have owned a Volkswagen? Raise your hand. First How many people here's parents have owned? If you've owned a Volkswagen, keep your hands up. Okay, if your parents owned a Volkswagen, also raise your hands. If you've ridden around in a Volkswagen, also raise your hands. If you've ever seen the Volkswagen commercial that was on a couple of years ago with the black Volkswagen named Max, raise your hands as well. Okay, almost every single person in this room raise their hands. When I say be relevant, we made a movie because right then, Volkswagen was spending almost $100 million advertising old Volkswagens, using their black little car, Max, a little black butt, that talked, and it was a cool Volkswagen, and then shortly after, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a Volkswagen bus. So we put our actors in this vehicle, and we leveraged Volkswagen United States of America, and we were able to connect with them. The other thing is the movie is based on a true story, and it has a very real element. So one of the first things that we did with our marketing background is we called up uh, a particular company, uh, which what was the name of the grief counseling company? Grief Toolbox. That's a new one. Um, it's a major uh, uh, we can't grief publication the name. company back then. Anyways, we called up the name of the largest grief publication company in the entire face of the planet. They provide all of the grief educational material for every counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, pretty much in the face of the planet. And we said, hey, we're making a little movie and we want it to be relevant and we're kind of wondering, do you guys think that maybe you can kind of consult with us to make sure we got the grief stuff going right? And they said, major motion picture? We'd love to. And we kind of crossed our fingers and hoped that the 1.2 million people 
that are part of their membership of society, all professionals, would somehow get wind of what we were doing. And sure enough, I don't know, six, seven months after we started working on this process, we get a phone call one day. And it was them. And they're like, hey, we were kind of wondering, do you mind if we tell everybody that we're counseling for a major motion picture? And we thought to ourselves, hmm, 1.2 million professionals getting exposed to our movie for free. I think we can send some paperwork over. We'll figure out how we can make that happen. We'll work with you guys on this. <laughs> and on and on and on this went. And it was about, again, being relevant. And it's about thinking outside the box. And last but not least, being excellent. As we worked hard on this, again, we've never made a movie before. We didn't have time to read the book. Seth was literally writing scenes right before we were supposed to film it. We're out on the road. He's writing the scene right before we're supposed to film it. There was one scene in particular where he didn't even get to finish writing it all the way. I'm just like, give me the gist. Give me the gist. Tell me what, what's going to happen more or less. You know, we'll figure it out later. But just give me, tell me. I need to finish. And that's how we did this movie. Now, again, this is not a substitute for being haphazard. Because what we wanted it to be was an excellent product. We put our heart and soul into this from start to finish. It has a phenomenal message. It has a message of hope and inspiration. But it also was done very, very well. And it was also done as a business model that actually generates profit instead of loses investment capital. And these days, I believe, honestly, if that you can be creative, if you can be relevant, and you can be excellent, it doesn't matter what area you're in. You can succeed. Because a lot of times we have people who are following two of those models, or even maybe one of those models, but they're not really interested in all three. And that's definitely a key. So that moved us into something else. As we went to sell the movie, you'll notice we started filming it two years ago and we just signed a distribution deal. So it took us a long time. But during that time to actually sign the right distribution deal, we learned a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of valuable educational experiences. And what that did is that taught us that we needed to be even farther ahead of the curve than we were. Because back when we filmed this movie, we shot it in HD. Nobody went, whoa. No it's too common. Went. Exactly, it's too common. What's your name? You're Steve. Steve. Oh, Steve, I like you. Thank you. <laughs> so we shot in HD. Well, back then, HD was kind of state of the art. It was. I mean, now we've got HD in our pocket on our phones. Who cares? You don't say, now it's a faux pas. If you go around and say, well, I'm going to shoot that in HD, people look at you and go, <laughs> hey, you can't hardly buy a standard definition camera unless you go to a used antique store these days. So it kind of goes without saying. So about a year ago, we were coming back from LA from a meeting that we had there. My partner Seth and I were in the car, and we were talking about our next move. And uh, he was going, what if we made the biggest movie ever for the smallest movie screen on the face of the planet? And we thought, that's what I said. Were you in the car? No. I said, huh. I said it just like that, too. I said, huh, that's a brilliant idea. That is a brilliant idea. The biggest movie ever for the smallest screen in the world. Well, again, let me come to the little, the little part in case you guys didn't figure out. We're entrepreneurs as well. We're a startup company. So as uh, we went to our CFO to see if we could get $100 million, um, he sadly let us know that we were about $100 million short of being able <laughs> of him to write that check. So we had to figure out something. Uh, we had to get a niche. And the niche that we looked for is, uh, I was just reading an article in Time Magazine, uh, the commemorative issue about Steve Jobs today. And I guess he liked to quote uh, for Wayne Gretzky. And uh, Wayne Gretzky may or may not have made the statement that says, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going to be. Well, the analogy that I actually like to use is that if you're a surfer, okay, you don't wait for the wave to come to you. Okay, you watch, first of all, you watch sets. In case you're not a surfer, wave comes in, waves come in sets. You find a set that you believe that's going to provide you the right wave. Then secondly, you position yourself to be able to catch the wave of the set that you're going to take. And more importantly, way before that wave ever gets to you, you turn around and you start paddling like the Dickens to be able to catch that wave at just the right spot to be able to ride the biggest and best swell that that wave can possibly give you. It's all about positioning. 
So yeah, that's great. We're gonna make a really big movie for a small screen. That doesn't give us any head start. It doesn't give us an advantage. It doesn't differentiate us from anybody else. We don't have a million dollar budget just to go out on Facebook and get people to look at our movie. So what are we gonna do? So we decided to go even crazier. Well, let's not just make the biggest movie ever for the smallest screen there is. Let's make it in 3D. We thought, my gosh, that's a phenomenal idea. That's absolutely, that's, let's do it. We're going to do it. Great, what movie do we make? I don't know, we don't have one. So uh, we started calling, we started calling through our, our list of contacts and whatnot, and we found a movie that was suitable. It was never intended to be done in 3D. We acquired the property. We acquired it for a song. And uh, we decided to formulate this movie in 3D. What I haven't told you guys is that we didn't know how to shoot 3D. We also didn't own any 3D cameras. We didn't know how to edit 3D. We didn't even know what 3D required to be done. But we knew we needed to position ourselves ahead of the wave. And so immediately we went into progress. We, we raised money again. And next thing you know, we're off and we're filming a 3D movie. And something that Harold and I were talking about earlier is collaboration, or as I like to call it, a collective. Uh, one of the bullet points of our company is that we want to be a company that brings together media mavericks into a collective. And what I mean by that is that so many times people try to do their own thing, and they forget that Oliver, are you awake, Oliver? Yeah, I was just checking. We forget that Oliver could collaborate with Harold, who could collaborate with Jason who could collaborate with Mary, and all of a sudden, they can be way more dynamic than Oliver could be by himself. And the opportunity to do that really unleashes exponentially your potential as a business person. It really, really does. Anytime you try and go, this is mine, this is what I'm going to do, you're pretty much limited to two hands and two feet, two legs, two eyes, two ears. As soon as you start operating in a collective or a network fashion, then all of a sudden, your capabilities become exponential. Because whoever I know, whoever's in my circle, whoever's in my network, and as soon as I link arms with, is it Jerry? Jerry. As soon as I link arms with Jerry over here, and we become partners in what we're doing, then all of a sudden, Jerry. You pull in another hundred people, I'll tell you. A hundred? That's pretty good. We gotta get you out more though. I tell you. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there we go. Let's say I knew 50 people and now I link up with Jerry because she has some interest in what we're doing too. Now all of a sudden there's 150 people. We just grew exponentially. So the idea of keep, thank you, your hands are warm, I like that. So the idea of keeping that going starts becoming amazing because you can do so much more. And uh, do you travel out of the country, Jerry? I traveled as an art teacher to Europe several times. Very good. I've never been to Europe. Oh, I've been all over America. the Caribbean, South America, Central America, South oh, Africa. Camel, so. uh, I've never been to Europe. <laughs> so all of a sudden, now my world has expanded because she's been to Europe. So right away, that adds several more countries into our little collaborative right here. And you can see how that can go on and on and on and on and on. But the idea is, is that if you stay tucked away to yourself, you will never achieve the full potential that you can. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So hopefully, Michael, I touched on some point that you asked me to speak about tonight. I don't really know. Um, but that's my spiel for you guys this evening. So um, I know I didn't touch a whole heck of a lot on what we're doing in 3D. Um, but I want to open it up. This is not supposed to be a, a speech to you guys. But I want to share with you guys a little bit about where we're coming from and a little bit about uh, how we see things. And now I'd actually like to open it up to, uh, to any of you guys who have any questions, thoughts, or comments. Yes, sir. Jason, I see that hand. Um, you familiar with the phrase uh, neophyte expertise? I sure am. Tell me, tell me how you feel about that. It sounds like uh, that's uh, kind of your modus operandi. Um, I don't think anything great is ever discovered by doing something that somebody's already done before. Um, I believe when you push new boundaries, when you do new things, I mean, obviously, you know, we got electricity, uh, you know, the airplane. Um, you have to push new ground. Um, pushing new ground, and again, you know, talking about the collaborative effort, you push new ground by yourself, it's pretty lonely and discouraging. And you have a lot of your closest friends, family, coworkers, business partners start questioning your sanity. 
as well as the fact if you're doing what you should be doing or if you're just out there, out there. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if I was going to make a chair, really the only thing that I get to improve on on this chair is, is a different style. It really is. Now, if I needed to solve a problem, though, then all of a sudden the chair becomes a whole different object. A whole different object. And what I mean by that is uh, we were, we were uh, scoping out, a, a, we've got a 3D cooking show that we're actually working on. And um, the concept of the show is that we would have a five-star chef who was an excellent world-renowned chef, but who was only skilled in cooking one thing, and that's sushi. This is a true story. And uh, this guy, his name is Taro. They own a, a, a series of restaurants, or a chain of restaurants called Lakuni and uh, in three different states. And he is an amazing five-star chef, but all he can cook is sushi. That's it. He cannot cook a hamburger. He cannot operate a microwave properly. He is a genius with a knife and with fish and with cooking white rice. That's about it. So the idea of the show is that people call in or come in, a abbreviated version from all over the United States, and they bring in grandma's special recipe for the best fried chicken in the world. And he helps them add the finesse to the recipe, but they have to teach him how to cook. And so we were in this uh, place where they had a kitchen, and uh, we were looking for the most versatile kitchen because we have different needs, obviously, but we have one kitchen that we have to film in because of placement of 3D cameras and whatnot. And um, we saw something that I've never seen before. And what I saw was a microwave for folks who are uh, physically disabled, who are in wheelchairs. And what this microwave was is, you know, you guys typically know if you have a microwave built into your kitchen, um, it's usually up above the stove, exactly. So you would roll up in your wheelchair and you'd press a button on the counter and the entire microwave system would lower down onto, on top of the oven. And then you could put your stuff in from being seated in a wheelchair and then all of a sudden it raised back up. So now all of a sudden that invention is something that is absolutely phenomenal to the price tag of $40,000. And yet they sell them like crazy. All of a sudden it makes that chair, quote unquote, something that's unique, something that's special, something that serves uh, or solves a problem and fills a niche. So I think coming back to the whole neophyte idea, I think you have to look outside the box. You have to do things differently. You can't look at stuff the same way. One of the reasons, sir, may I borrow your business card? How many people in this room have their own business card? Almost everybody here. How many people in the room, the general shape of the business card is like this? How many people get handed a business card at a meeting like tonight, and you take the business card that you're handed in, put it into a roll of bags, dump it in your purse, wherever else, stick it in the file, give it to your secretary later? You don't remember like who it was. Don't remember who it was. What if I handed you my business card tonight, and my business card actually looked and was shaped like this. What would happen? Mark, tell me, what would happen? With the little notch with the hole over it? I don't know. You tell me. I just gave you my card. Yeah. Um, it's going to go into my pocket too, but it's not going to fit into the roll of it the same way. It's going to have to be kept out in a separate place. Did you guys hear that? Let me repeat it out loud. I'm going to simplify it. It's going to go in his pocket too, but it's not going to fit in the Rolodex. It's going to have to go in a separate place. Okay, that's simply stupid thinking. But yet it's effective because my business card now is not like everybody else's business card that's roughly the same dimension. It's something that's super simple, but all it takes is a moment of thinking outside the box. Our very first business card for a marketing company, and one of the reasons why we generate business was very sim very similar to what I did with your card, Mark. Thank you very much for donating your card to science. Um, but it was a square card. It had three corners and one rounded corner. Can you guys imagine what happened? Can I borrow that card again? Mark is a nonconformist. Mark went ahead and he had to open the card back up, flatten it back out, make sure everything was just nice. That's perfect. I love you guys. Our first card was this size and shape, roughly. It was a perfectly square card. It was two inches by two inches. Does anybody know the dimensions of an average business card? 
three by one quarter. and three quarters average business card. So it doesn't okay. fit in the one. That. Two inches by two inches will not fit in your business card, or it will stick out in your Rolodex. Right. It'll stick so it'll stick, stick out a quarter inch in your Rolodex, more or less. Ingenuity behind that. The other thing was is that this card that I folded over, this corner that I folded over, was actually rounded. And the reason why it was rounded is because it is human nature. Human nature. If I have three things are the same, we fixate on the one thing that is different. I guarantee, I wish I would have brought a business card. I'll have to start doing this. If I would hand any one of you this business card, this is exactly what happened. I'd hand you the business card. we keep on talking. And this is what you would do, Mark. And you can't help yourself. You would put your fingers on both corners. You would feel the round edge. This, this all happens subconsciously. You would feel the round edge, and you would begin to rotate the card in your hand. And you would virtually keep on doing that the entire time that I kept on talking to you. When I got done talking to you, you would look at the card, hold it by the rounded corner, and we'd finish our conversation. You would switch hands and keep on rolling. And then it would eventually wind up in your pocket or something like that. I guarantee you that's exactly what happened. Simple. It's always simple. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but by doing something new, by taking a concept and looking at it differently, because you have to remember, what's the point of a business card? That they can find you. That they can find you. Remember but you. honestly, that's it. They need to remember you. If they remember you, they'll find you if they want you bad enough. We, this was what, seven years ago, something like that, where we were doing this seven, eight, nine years ago. Yeah, we didn't have a phone number on our business cards back then. Why? Because I didn't want you calling me. So if you wanted to hire us as a client, I wanted you to work really, really hard to find us. Because then why? When you finally found us, I knew I had a pretty good chance of landing the deal. If you went through all that trouble to get a hold of us, we had already made a connection. One, Mark remembered us. Two, went through all the work to find us. And then three, when we connected... We had a touch point. Is anybody here in sales? Okay, so uh, I won't pick on you, Mark. Sir in the back there, I yes. can't see a name tag. What's your name? Zach. Zach, it's a pleasure to meet you, Zach. Nice to meet you. So how many points of contact do you typically need in order to guarantee a sale? Well, maybe six to eight. Six to eight. Okay, so if we're listening to radio, or we watching television, radio, anybody here in radio? Anybody know anything about frequency? Oh, some on the radio. <laughs> okay, so Mark, do you know about frequency? You need repetition. Exactly. You know how many times somebody needs to hear something before they hear something? At least three. Three is how many times you actually need to listen to a radio ad before it even enters your psyche. Seven times is how many times you need to hear that same exact radio ad. Not a variation, the same exact radio ad before you consciously digest the information that they've put in your ears. <coughs> Okay, so if I want to make a sale, I need to make some points of contact. I need to emotionally get involved. The funny thing is, is when I was showing you guys a demonstration about turning the card in your hand, there was something else that was happening to you. Does anybody know what was happening there? There was another transaction that was taking place. Movement. Movement's good. Imprinting. Kinetic more... learning. Imprinting. Kinetic learning. Okay, uh, I'm going to take that combination right there. There's a physiological transaction that was taking place. Even though it was paper, it actually puts just a tiny bit of pain into your nervous system. So we were imprinting them. And it wasn't hurting them, obviously, because they kept on doing it, but you're literally doing an imprint into their psyche. You're branding. We were tattooing ourselves into people's remembrance. If that's a strong connection, it's a very, very strong connection. So anytime you want to do something, just look at what you have and figure out how to do it just a little bit differently. If everybody's going this way and you need to go that way, that's fine. You can go that way too. But if everybody's traveling a straight line like this, what happens if you walk just to the side and you actually take in the view for a little bit? You have an opportunity to gain a different perspective. And perhaps you can fine-tune or perhaps you can solve a problem. Because a lot of times the solution for something is just by casually observing what's going on by not being in the mix in order to see how something can be done better. And with our 3D technology, um, you know, we, we didn't invent 3D. Does anybody know when the first 3D movie came out? 
House of Wax. Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Yes. Yes. House of Wax. So good. Do you remember the year? <laughs> no. Good answer. 50? 1957. 1957. So the first 3D movie in theaters, House of Wax. So we're all talking about new 3D technology. It's not new. It's not new. 50 years ago, they were doing it already. They were doing it already. But the way of doing it can be different. The way of presentation can be different. You know, I brought some anaglyph glasses. Um, you know, and this is what most of us remember watching the first 3D movies. You know, all the colors distorted. You know, one red eye, one blue eye. And nowadays, we have these super cool things. They're called active shutter glasses. So now you have to wear glasses with battery packs on your face and two lenses that are shifting colors really fast to give you that 3D effect. Or then you go to the movie theater and you wear polarized glasses. And those are only even possible because we have lasers now that can make scratches so tiny that our eye can't perceive them, but yet and create a polarization effect in our eyes so we can see the 3D on the screen. But yet that next level has to go even further because how many people here like going to the movies and putting on a pair of glasses? Half of us wear glasses already and it's a pain in the butt. Last thing you want to do is put on another pair of glasses on top of the glasses they already have. So obviously there is a, an opportunity for something to be solved or improved. And that's the way that any industry is. You can look at stuff differently. I came into the cigar store at a disadvantage. I could not get the accounts that everybody else could. I could not buy the cigars or sell the cigars that everybody else could. So I had to look for an opportunity. Your greatest opportunities are usually found in your biggest challenges. If you can find a big problem, then you have an opportunity to come up with a great solution. And that can always be profitable. But again, it comes back to those three things. It comes about being creative, first off, to find that solution. Being relevant, make sure it's a solution that people actually want. And then lastly, be excellent. Be excellent with it. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but it's fun talking. But we're in an opportunity with Google on this movie to do worldwide distribution um, on a particular device that they're coming out with for this movie. Um, this would be the first movie ever um, that was filmed in 3D specifically for a mobile platform. Um, obviously, there's lots of 3D movies that are out, but we uh, literally built a custom-made 3D camera system in order to uh, film this to be shown on mobile devices. And um, right now, we are working on our 3D trailer. And I was hoping to actually have the 3D trailer to bring for you guys, um, but I don't quite have the 3D as nice as I'd like it to be. And we are about being excellent, so we're a little bit shy of where I'd like it to be in order to show it to the public, but uh, we ought to be there within the next week or two. So one of the things that I'd like to do is uh, Google has enabled this really awesome technology for us to actually be able to load this up on to the internet in order to let you guys see it live. Um, so what I'd love to do is one of the uh, next times that you guys get together, if we can configure that the trailer's about a minute, ten seconds long, something like that. And uh, I'd love to be able to provide that for you guys uh, to be able to see that. But we're close, um, but it's not yet excellent. So almost, I try, I try. Yes, sir. Harold. So, I'm uh, anyway. Howard, but I called you. Howard, so I'm far. sorry. That's okay. I called you Victor, and I've called you Hugo. <laughs> so we're even. So we're even. I've got your name wrong a, a few times. We don't know his name because he has no Hector. name card. Hector. No one gave me a name card, Jerry. That's uh, my fault. Tell me your name. Oh, tell me my name. Oh, tell me my name. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way to keep a speaker humble. My name is Hector. Okay. H E C T O R. Howard, I'm sorry, sir. So, to try to kind of kick this more into the interactive gear, um, you probably, when you talk to different people, you may not know some of the background. A lot of the people here have done a lot of very, very original things. So, we have a lot of the same arrows in our back that you do for, because basically it's easier to dominate turf that doesn't exist. So, for a creative person, it's always easier to invent something that wasn't there before and then declare that you're in charge of it. And I've spent my whole life doing that. Part of the problem is a lot of people didn't actually care because I was in charge of stuff they never heard of. And so even though I got the positioning, and I caught the wave and I re really noticed for about 20 years, and by then, other people made a lot of money. So I think one of your messages, uh, besides the whole positioning thing, which I think a lot of us know, your attitude is just fantastic because you don't care whether or not you have capital or whether you have a team or there's a business structure. And I think that's a really, really important message for you know, analytical types who think that you have to have a 100-page business plan because you don't. 
In fact, every time you write a 100-page business plan, investors don't even read it anyway. So, so I think part of your message is this, the spontaneity and the desire to like go for it. Because when you do try to follow the formula, the Silicon Valley VC formula, it almost never ever, ever works. Uh, it, it, it works a few times. So you hear about this, you hear about Google and Yahoo big companies, and, and even Yahoo looks like it was big, and that looks like it's dumb. But uh, so I really admire the fact to go for it. They also call this beginner's mind. Uh, besides, so when you don't know anything about something, which I don't know anything about most of the things I do too, you can actually get pretty far as long as there's nobody else competing with you. But here's going to be the challenge. Uh, 3D is pretty easy to do now. Uh, it's, it's really easy to do. But it's not easy to do excellently mm. because of what you described. Nobody wants to put the glasses on because Jason and I worked on 3D stuff 15 years ago. And it was, it was mind-blowingly good 15 years ago, but it never made it in the public because the public never could actually deal with the glasses or the technology that could deliver it. And the Consumer Electronics Show, right now, the single largest category in marketing is 3D movies. Mm -hmm. So people are spending billions of dollars, billions, not millions, billions, trying to sell 3D, and the American public and the global public is pretty much said, eh, we don't want to buy another TV, we don't want to buy another pair of glasses. So it is very cool to be nifty and get there first and to do stuff. But I still think 3D is probably a good stepping stone for you to get to some other place that you want to go, as opposed to actually being anywhere because the world hasn't embraced it. I mean, most of the consumer electronics business has declared this to be a write-off. That's a failure. It didn't work. So whether it's on a big screen or a small screen, it's very hard. And the problem is the laws of physics instead of the laws of marketing. The laws of physics say that the sweet spot has to be really small because the wavelength of light is a very small dimension. So if you move over by about an inch, it's gone. So you can't actually watch 3D TV that looks so good. It's, 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 it's a big problem. So That's true. It's a holy grail. And 3D sound also has the same problem. Mm -hmm. And what? instead, 3D so, sound has the same sound. problem. And how many people do you know that really place the speakers in their living room with a sweet spot sitting in a chair in the right place so they could hear their speakers now? It used to be, it used to be everybody, but now with MP3 files, you can't hear the difference anyway. So, so it's, it's a hard sell to sell the excellence, even if you can do the excellence. So, um, so my question for you is, what are you going to use this as a stepping stone to? Because I bet you have five more ideas that you're ready to do, because this is a great positioning exercise, but you're going to ride this way somewhere else. So, absolutely. Where are you going? Absolutely. Wow. That was a loaded question. That was really good. Um, everything that Howard said is absolutely accurate. Um, you know, I described to you guys a chain of career. You know, I started as a highway patrol officer. We did cigars, did marketing. Uh, we're on our second movie right now. But what we're looking to do is we're looking to become uh, literally the most relevant distribution company on the face of the planet. You know, no small goal. Um, we are looking to literally be one of the companies that facilitates huge amounts of video production for distribution all over the world. And I was talking with Gloria earlier tonight and uh, we have a special we have a special thing that we're interested in. Uh, we particularly are only interested in creating, producing, distributing uh, content that is inspirational or hopeful. And don't get that confused with religious or this or that because I didn't say that. Um, but you know how many people have flipped through even just uh, you know just random commercials on TV and you see some stuff that's kind of a little bit shocking now compared to what they were showing on TV 5, 10, 15 years ago. You know, I have a, a three-year-old little girl at home. She just turned three. I have a 15-year-old daughter as well. Um, and I'm sometimes shocked, and I'm, you know, I'm in this industry. I'm sometimes shocked at some of the stuff that's passed off for entertainment um, that slides under the wire. And uh, most importantly is I've seen some really great movies that end and you're just like, oh man, you walk out miserable. Um, I love watching movies that I walk out pretty happy and feeling good. Um, and that doesn't mean they need to be cheesy and it doesn't mean that they need to, yeah, they just need to make the human condition feel good like there's hope. Um, and those are the movies that we're interested in doing. Um, you know, we want to overcome bad with good. And it, it's real simple. I'll never be able to stop all the bad stuff. And I don't care to. I'm not going to go on strike. I'm not going to protest. 
That's not at all what we're about. But we do have the ability to produce by helping other people produce overwhelming amounts of good content. You asked a question where we're going. We want to be the largest distribution company of media material in the entire face of the planet. So uh, why did we make a 3D movie? Uh, not because I care about 3D at all. Uh, you know, every single one of you just about in this room is looking at me in 3D right now. It is not new technology. If you have two eyeballs, you should be in 3D pretty much. Uh, so we've been doing this for a long time. The technology just simply hasn't really caught up with the reality. The reality is 3D. We just need the technology to go the rest of the step. And eventually it will. Uh, when it gets there, I don't really care. But what I saw was an opportunity. What I saw is, how do I get people to notice? You know, you mentioned two things. You mentioned excellence. I'm not showing you the trailer, even though I have it here, because it's not excellent. And so I get one opportunity for a first impression. So when you guys see the trailer, I want you to go, wow, the guy with the crazy hair really did have a good 3D trailer. That was pretty awesome. I might even go see the movie at $25 a ticket or whatever. <laughs> so um, we definitely were creative in what we were doing. The first ever major motion picture filmed specifically for a mobile device, we were able to do that because we were creative in our camera system. Hollywood can't afford. The total budget of our movie was 250 grand. Okay, to give you an idea, for those of you who are not cinephiles, uh, has anybody here seen Avatar or any other 3D movie for that matter? Okay, I'm just going to pick on James Cameron. Everybody knows Titanic. He made Avatar. He really, honestly, has probably the best state-of-the-art 3D equipment on the face of the planet right now. Every single one of his cameras averages about $500,000 per camera. Okay, our least expensive camera was 1200 bucks, and our most expensive camera was about $11,000. We shot as good quality, as good if not better quality than anything James Cameron has ever done. We did it outside of the box. Our necessity was the mother of invention and we were able to do something that we couldn't throw money at, so we had to find a solution by doing something differently. So we got the creativity down, and we got the excellence down, so relevance is a question. So we could do something really well, like Howard said, and we, we created something that was totally awesome, but yeah, it doesn't generate. Like I said, you need all three. So our relevance was exactly this. 3D right now is a wave. And as you guys know, waves come, and waves... Everybody together, thinking waves come and waves go. go. Exactly. It'll come and it'll go. But what that wave is doing is that wave gave us an audience with Google. Okay, we don't live in Silicon Valley. We live in Auburn. Okay? We live in Auburn. We didn't know anybody here. Now we know you guys. That's really cool. Um, but we didn't know anybody here. And we didn't have any accolades to get us through the door because no one really cared that we made a $50,000 movie. But it was an excellent educational experience, and it was profitable for our investors. So that set us up for the next platform. We wanted to be relevant, and that's why we made a 3D movie for a cell phone. Because at $500,000 per camera, James Cameron can't afford to make a movie for a cell phone. There's not enough money in it. We can. We did. Why can't he? We will. Because it cost entirely too much money for him to put his crew into a movie oh, of that size. Oh, for unions and everything? Yeah. Yeah, for unions, cost of cameras alone, his oh. salary, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, okay. And controlled by a studio. Yeah. yeah, just so you guys know, I know some of you are in the room are aware of it, but we have a licensing opportunity for Google. So the way a movie usually works is that it goes through distribution. People buy tickets, DVDs, da 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 Google is coming out with a 3D tablet that has an LG screen in it. And what Google has made us the offer is they said, will you guys license us the movie to pre-install in our 3D tablets that are coming out? So it means one paycheck, one time, okay? And, and that's, that's fine, you know, whatever that paycheck is, it's kind of irrelevant. But what we do know is they've, er they've ordered and paid for 35 million screens. What does that mean for our movie? That means I've got 35 million viewers. Let's talk about relevance. Whose first experience is your technology? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't care if I never make another 3D movie again. Okay, with 35 million viewers of platform, a $250,000 or $250, investment capital, our guarantee alone will we'll, we'll make at least 10 times that back just on the licensing deal with Google. And, oh, wait. For those of you guys who are sharp on business, I said licensing. They're not buying the movie. 
That means I still own it. When we're done with their window of licensing, I have the opportunity to sell it and license it over and over and over again. But Google gives me instant distribution to 37 countries around the world. And with some of the new technology that Google's working on right now, they're working on instant voice translator. So not only am I required to have subtitles in my movie, which Google currently translates into 27 different languages, with their new voice translator, it will translate into 18 different languages on the flip of a button. So whether you're in Japan, or China, or Korea, or a number of other countries at Google services, our movie is relevant there too. Now granted, it's a fad. You watch it, it's a good movie. I like it, I enjoyed it. It's got a great message, it's hopeful, it's inspirational. But it's just a movie. It'll come and it'll go. But what did a platform of relevance to 35 million people in 38 countries around the world do for us? That positioned us to make a move to become one of the largest distribution companies in the face of the planet. That's what our next step is. So, well, you've got a question, Mark. So. Yeah. So I'm thinking 35 million viewers, of whom 1 to 5% say, well, I, like, I want to play with this. So there goes your technology um, replicated. So now you've got a million to 5 million individuals in, in 200,000 to a million teams trying to make movies for your distribution system. Using this technology. Are you getting excited, Mark? Well, I'm getting excited. This is, this, is a, this is where I'm actually leading to. What I'm leading to is there are 6,000 languages left on this planet out of the 9,000 or 10,000 that there were four or 500 years ago. And this is an opportunity for people to actually create their culture vividly with high quality in, in documenting it in the culture. And also, it's an opportunity to teach sustainability with great video, and apparently translate in a lot of languages. And I have a friend who has a translation engine that could extend that. That's awesome. Uh, for those of you guys who didn't hear what Mark said, and forgive me because I'm going to capsulize it, but uh, Mark immediately saw the exponential potential of what we were doing. And he said some key words uh, that we're very involved in. We want to shape culture. I want the largest distribution network on the face of the planet because I want to shape culture. I want to overcome evil with good, so to speak. I want to put out great content. I want people to be inspired. I want people to be hopeful. I don't want people to be depressed. Uh, there's a lot of bad crap that happens. Like, can I say crap here? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Crap. Um, I don't want people to be overwhelmed with the problems of life. You know, there's a, a Chinese proverb that says it rains on the good people and the bad people. Okay, bad stuff happens to everybody, whether we lose a loved one or in a car accident, uh, whatever the case is. Um, bad stuff happens, it's part of life. But it doesn't have to drag us down. It doesn't have to drag us down. And I believe that entertainment is one of the easiest, most effective ways to change an inspired culture. It's one of the easiest ways to cross cultural boundaries. It's one of the easiest ways to inspire creativity. And if we can put good quality content out there that people can feel good about and be inspired to do it themselves, now all of a sudden that's actually changing the world for the better. You know, um, I, I don't know if anybody here wears Tom's shoes. Does anybody wear Tom's shoes? Does anybody know the story of Tom's? He's one of your guys' neighbors down here. He's in Silicon Valley somewhere, I think. But anyways, every time you buy a pair of Tom's shoes, he donates a pair to a kid in a third world country. And the idea is, for those of you guys who haven't traveled outside into third world countries, is most schools require uniforms. In the poorest of countries, they require uniforms for kids to go to school. If the kids do not have uniforms, they cannot go to school. And the uniforms are as simple as usually a particular colored shirt, particular colored pants, and shoes. And obviously most kids are walking around with shirts and pants, but a lot of them don't have shoes. That's not part of their culture. They don't have shoes. So he started a company that every time you buy a pair of $40 Mexican slip-ons, he donates a pair to a kid in another country. And they make what's called a shoe drop. So they fly a plane over to these different places, and they'll drop 10,000 pairs of shoes at a time so kids can go to school. And uh, that's great. That's awesome. But that's not sustainable. And I'm not knocking Tom's at all. He's built a great empire. It's not sustainable. 
Uh, what Mark mentioned is something that's very near and dear to our hearts. I've been going to South Africa out in the bush every single year except for one for the last eight years. And we work with kids over there and, and grown-ups over there who uh, are about are about 45 minutes away from the nearest electricity. They live in huts, dirt roads, this and that, and everything else. They have all kinds of sicknesses and this and that and stuff that's going on. Um, but one of the things that I see, you know, and that breaks my heart and I cry and blah, blah, blah. Um, but one of the things that I see is that, honestly, there is no sustainability, okay? I'm going to drop a pair of shoes over there, and when those shoes wear out, what are they doing? Standing around waiting for another pair of shoes to fall out of the sky. And again, I'm not picking on Tom's. So let's edit this part out. Um, I'm not at all picking on Tom's. He's doing a great and admirable thing, but it's not sustainable. If you guys stop buying Tom's shoes, which there's only one person in here who can raise your hand, if you guys stop buying Tom's shoes, what happens to the free, ki the free shoes for kids? Okay, but what we're talking about doing is technology is getting so inexpensive right now. The same African village that's 45 minutes away from the nearest electricity, one out of four kids last year is carrying a cell phone. A smartphone. Okay, these kids walk 45 minutes away to a grocery store. When you get inside the grocery store, there's a big wall and a counter. And there's electrical sockets about every 18 inches. And they walk with their friends 45 minutes in the dirt to get to this grocery store and plug in their phones and hang out for a couple hours while they charge. I mean, we have this one little girl, her name is Dugu. She's, uh, we've kind of quote unquote adopted her right now. I got back from South Africa, and so all of a sudden my cell phone beeps, and I look, and it's some weird, bizarre number, and it's a picture text that this little girl sent me. They've got 4G networks that are better than what we have in the United States throughout the entire country. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Technology has become an equalizer. We can teach people how to shoot stuff on a cell phone. There was a movie I just watched that uh, came out as a feature-length movie, and it was shot completely on a cell phone, and it was beautiful. And had I not told you, you would not know. The cell phones today are more powerful than really great cameras of 30 and 40 years ago.